Pauline Kael is, is my next guest. She's a film critic for the New Yorker magazine. And uh, I always like to read Pauline Kael. I, if you don't get the New Yorker, or you don't see her criticism. Um, here's a sample of her writing. She's talking about, she says, uh, she's talking about uh, films that try to be like some of the older films. Laments for the entertaining movies of the past are pointless. With rare exceptions, those movies are still around to be seen and enjoyed at revivals or on television, but we cannot imitate them successfully now, nor should we try. She skipped, I'm skipping some. I can't even review the $25 million Torah, Torah, Torah. After a half hour, I fell into a comatose state. <laughs> Reprieved by the intermission, I sneaked away. It was always too late for a movie that, uh, it was always too late for a movie that thinks it's being fair to the Japanese by having Japanese actors behave like slit-eyed Americans. The cast of non-Japanese, Leon Ames, Neville Brand, George McCready, and James Whitmore, and Wesley Addy, and Leora Dane, and E.G. Marshall ad infinitum has all the charisma of a veteran's convention. <laughs> with that weary bunch of second-string actors, the war seems to have been caused by American innervation. And with lines like, I must get back to the fleet, there is a lot to be done, who needs bombs? Uh, I, I do recall one joke, though an inadvertent one, when some poor historical facsimile of an actor stands by a window and cries, for God's sake, man, that's not a paper fleet out there. And the view is so pathetically fake that one's first thought is, well, if it isn't paper, what is it, an oil painting? Um, anyway, uh, she's considered a tough reviewer and is known for liking movies that sometimes violate all the critical canons and for disliking films that seem to have great appeal. And so it's always refreshing to read Miss Pauline Kael. You welcome her? Good to see you. Do you mind following your own prose, uh, standing in the <laughs> No, way? it's quite unnerving because you always forget your old reviews, and then when you hear them, they sound so brutal. And I didn't think that was as brutal when I wrote it. I always think of myself as very generous and open, that I leave people their skins, and, and then when <laughs> I hear something, I think, oh, my God. You said, I think you said later in that review, that, uh, implied at least, that the suspense was not about the bombing, but whether 20th Century Fox would survive. Though. Yes, it did survive. It's yeah. still rather astonishing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think it survived because of that film, but because of, of good luck. Well, one of your films helped it to survive, uh, Planet of the Apes. Oh, oh yeah. And yeah. Uh, then, of course, MASH, <coughs> and uh, I think Butch Cassidy was 20th. There were a, a so few winners to balance out some of uh, the big epics. 25 million? Is that, I've forgotten uh, on Torah, 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 I think so. But you know, last year and the year mm -hmm. before, that was not a very large figure. Uh, mm -hmm. This year, the big bombs are around the six million to eight million dollar category, yeah. uh, which uh, m which is still a big bomb for the studios because they don't have as much money mm -hmm. as they did last year. Uh, I'd love to talk about something related to this because sure. uh, the studios are so short of money that they're throwing pictures into theaters now without enough advance publicity. Publicity. And one picture that got, you know, uh, thrown in this way about 10 days ago was a film called McCabe and Mrs. Miller that uh. I think is a beautiful film. And I don't think the good reviews will have time to catch up with it uh, if the public doesn't go see it because some of the network people were so quick uh, in panning it and some of the mm. columnists were so quick in panning it uh, that the picture may not survive long enough for the good reviews, which I feel sure in the long run it will get. I mean, I'm reasonably sure that this is a movie that's going to live and that in future years people will think of as an important film. But right now it, it may die because of such strange things as an attack by Rona Barrett and an attack by Rex Reed, which in the normal course of affairs might not be taken so seriously, but because they got out before other reviews, uh, uh -huh. they may sort of saturate the atmosphere. Rona and Rex both, uh, both weighed in heavily against They, they it, were it? fairly uh, strong on it, yes. I, yeah. I think they both described it as garbage and both complained about obscene language. Uh, now, normally this wouldn't matter. I mean, normally the weeklies and the monthlies would get their reviews out, but now pictures are opening with hardly any advance preparation. And this is a film that puts you off if, if you don't know what to expect. It's a, it's a rather difficult film. I think it's almost as if a European 
film had opened without advanced preparation. And you can imagine what might happen to, the, to a film, say, by Ingmar Bergman, if it were greeted, say, by Rona Barrett. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, it takes a certain amount of preparation to get an audience attuned to it. And in this particular case, the film simply didn't have it. Uh, I, I'm interested in it because there are so few good American movies, and I think in this case, Robert Altman has done something really innovative, and I think it's the fact that his approach is different that is throwing the press off, at least the press that has panned it thus far. Yeah, you liked it for the reasons that... I that a lot of people didn't. They said, well, it doesn't have a strong plot and you can't hear every line of dialogue or something. And you made a point of the fact that in, uh, yeah, so in well, case sure. you miss a word or two, and that works in the case of this movie. Because right. Of the... uh, well, it's so obvious, if you think about it for a minute, that it's not because it's a bad soundtrack. Mm. It's because you hear only what you need to hear, and you get a certain hum of conversation in the background. The mm. first time you lose a word, you're likely to think, oh, what was that? But by the second time, you realize you're not meant to hear it. And, and there's no great hassle about it. You don't need to hear all the words. Most of the words in movies aren't worth hearing anyway. And you, and you forget get them as soon as you've heard them. They're like, uh, you know, words on television dramatic shows. Uh, there's no great loss if you don't get all the dialogue. And people talk during the show anyway. Uh, certainly the television generation talks steadily and doesn't miss anything. Uh, but here, the fact that you couldn't hear a few words seems to have thrown uh, certain members of the press off as if it were an insult to the American public, that every word wasn't, you know, lucidly clear. I think the real thing is that that movies in general are laid out for an audience. Uh, that is, the director gives you a fix on the characters immediately and tells you how to view the whole picture right from the opening. And this particular picture, you have to feel your way into it. And it takes a while, and it catches you up. But if you go with it, I think the rewards are much richer, uh, that it's a much fuller experience than an ordinary movie. Yeah. And, and it's made, it is made by Robert Altman, who made MASH. That's so, right. Uh, and that I think case, a lot of people would go just on the basis of that, since MASH had such a wide following. Well, except uh, for this ambience that a few bad reviews can create. And I think a few of the other critics who are quite good uh, simply didn't get with the picture. I think they somewhat misinterpreted it. I, I didn't know that the television movie critics had that much power. I, I know that the... Uh, the well, television I think, play critics seem to have... I some. think ordinarily they wouldn't. I think mm. because of the new policies of the studios of opening movies cold, they do simply because they get out there faster than anybody. Uh, and they do command a wide audience. And even though if you think about it for a minute, uh, most people wouldn't take the word of some of those critics very seriously. But they do create an atmosphere. And everyone has heard that it's no good. They don't remember perhaps that that initiated with Rona Barrett. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people used to say that they didn't go by Bosley Crowther, uh, but in a funny way, his opinion carried a lot of weight simply because it was in the New York Times and, and people heard it. And right. they often heard it second or third rate. It began to seem like word of mouth. Uh, and I do think that, you know, the tradition of the gossip columnist uh, we had thought was buried with Hedda and Luella. Mm -hmm. uh, not that they're both buried. I, I, uh, Luella is still with us. No, she uh, isn't. Oh, oh, yes, I believe so. I, uh, I, she's no longer Sorry, active. Do we have a seance? To <laughs> check out? Uh, Sorry. Oh, is she alive? Uh, oh, yes. I honestly didn't know that. Oh, yes, that, yes, you know, I, I believe she's alive. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, that tradition had seemed to be buried yeah. in which people came on as if certain films were insults. And they were never banal films. Mm -hmm. They were never ordinary films. And I think this is true now also. Uh, I mean, an ordinary banal studio product is likely to be acclaimed as the masterpiece for this week. But if a film is a unusual or difficult, or if it really, if it has any kind of artistic resonance, then they're much more likely to be hostile. And then for some strange reason, it's an insult to the American public, almost as if art were un-American. Excuse me, yeah. does Rona Barrett review? I didn't realize she did. I didn't know she was still on television. Well, I heard on her on this artists. and was astonished. And then she was followed, I believe, by Stuart Klein, who said he agreed with her. And I believe several of the other network people uh, have taken that. Uh, position. They, uh, interestingly enough, the gossip columnists attacked it for obscenity. 
Uh, it's, it's interesting often that, that people whose own livelihood is based on prying into other people's affairs uh, are the first to defend uh, uh, American morality. Which They're trying is a, to eliminate the competition, probably. That's, that's, that's possibly it. Yeah. Uh, this is not a film I found offensive in, in any way. I mean, I was hardly aware of, of the strong language. When you think about it, you realize it has some fairly strong language. But, you know, we would hope, I would think, that, that the freedom of the screen uh, had been fairly well established in the last few years. And just because people may be getting tired of a certain amount of nudity and, and a certain number of pornographic films, uh, because they are perhaps glutting the market. I hope that doesn't mean that we have to switch all the way back and start attacking movies just because they have a few free situations or, few, or right. a few free words. I agree with you. I, I hope, uh, we, uh, excuse me, Pauline, we must stop sure. for a moment while I hold up something. There's a kind of magic that happens without any, I'll hold up everything. That, that, oh, here it is. And it happens without any tricks. It's called Pure Magic by Max Factor. We'll be right back.